A motive is the underlying reason for any action that we take. Proverbs 16, 2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Because the human heart is very deceitful. In Jeremiah 17, 9, we read, The heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure, who can understand it? Oh, we can easily fool others and even ourselves about our own motives. How the church and it's all the good things of God are, have been used by people to gain personal power and influence or to puff themselves up with self-righteousness that they flaunt. Oh, it is a sad tale, the damage that has been done because of wrong motives. We can pretend that we're choosing certain actions for God or for the benefit of others when in reality we have selfish reasons. And God is not fooled by our selfishness and is, as we read in Hebrews 4.12, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. <coughs> We human beings operate from a variety of motion, motivations, and many of them are negative. Pride, anger, revenge, a sense of entitlement or the desire for approval can all be catalysts for our actions. Any motivation that originates in our sinful flesh is not pleasing to God. In Romans 8, 8, we read, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. God even evaluates the condition of our hearts when we give offerings to him. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And of course, there is that iconic story in Acts 5. Now, a man named Ananias, it says, unite, or together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lie just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. And then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. In this story, we're introduced to a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. We're told that they sold a piece of property 
and lay the proceeds of the sale at the feet of the apostles, which they were going to use to give to the poor. But they falsified the truth of the transaction. Their motive was not generosity, but their motive was greed. The judgment was not because of the amount of money they gave. They were free to give whatever they wanted. The judgment was for the misrepresentation, the wrong motive that would have crippled the church had that kind of behavior continued. There's no doubt that we are to see it as a judgment of God and is given to provoke fear and discernment in our own lives. So we see that false motives can lead to a disposition of cheating God out of the glory he derives from the purpose of our ministry. And the consequences can be very, very serious. We can play each other. We can fool the family. You can certainly fool your pastor. But you cannot fool God. God is no fool. And to treat him as such will have extremely serious consequences. Selfish motives can hinder our prayers as well. In James 4, 3, it says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Because our hearts are so deceitful, we should constantly evaluate our own motives and be willing to be honest with ourselves about why we're choosing a certain action. In fact, we can even preach and minister from impure motives. In Philippians, the first chapter, we read the words of Paul. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here, he was in prison, of course, for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. Now, his take on that was this. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Because of this, I rejoice. So if these people who have wrong motives are preaching an accurate gospel, at least the gospel is getting out. Paul's happy about that. But that does not consider the fact of how God looks at these people with false motives, with impure motives. God isn't happy about that. Current example, recent example in our lives is Ravi Zacharias. He was a master apologist. When I say apologist, that's a person who explains the Christian faith to those who aren't Christians. And he did a brilliant job of that. But we have discovered that his motivations were awful, abysmal. Proverbs 21, 27, Jesus spoke to this issue. And, and uh, he says, well, this is in Matthew 6, 1, rather. He said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. How Christ really attacked the Pharisees and the Sadducees for their self-righteousness, for doing all their almsgiving and, and, and doing all kinds of good things publicly, to make themselves look self-righteous. Self-righteousness is always a sign of wrong motives. We have no righteousness before God. We have humility before God. We can minister, I guess, then in the right way, but do so to earn our salvation. And if we're doing that, we're insulting God, aren't we? 
because Christ has paid it all. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and not uh, of, this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So what is the right motivation? In 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says, For we speak as messengers approved by God, to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Jesus declared in Mark 12, 30, 31, Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. God is indeed interested in our motives, perhaps even more so than our actions. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says that when Jesus comes again, he will bring to light, this is scary, isn't it? He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of our heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. God wants us to know that he sees what no one else sees. He knows why we do what we do and desires to reward those whose hearts are right with him. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did, not, did, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me you evildoers. Motives matter. We can keep our motives pure by continually surrendering every part of our hearts to the control of the Holy Spirit. As much as we know how to do that every day. These may be some helpful questions to help us evaluate our motives. If no one ever knows what I'm doing, giving, or serving, or sacrificing, would I still do it? If there was no visible payoff for doing this, would I still do it? Would I joyfully take a lesser position if God asked me to? Am I doing this for the praise of others or how it makes me feel? If I had to suffer for continuing what God has called me to do, would I continue? If others misunderstand or criticize my actions, will I stop? If those whom I am serving never show gratitude and repay me in any way, will I still do it? Do I judge my success or failure based on my faithfulness to what God has asked me to do or how I compare to others? Personal satisfactions such as taking a vacation or sports or whatever they are, not rewarding themselves. Motivation becomes an issue when we're not honest with ourselves about why we are doing these things. When we give the outward appearance of obeying God, but our hearts are hard. God knows that. We are deceiving ourselves and we're deceiving others. And the only way we can operate from pure motives is when we walk in the Spirit, as it says in Galatians 5, when we allow Jesus to control every part of us, when our desire is to please Him and not ourselves. Our flesh constantly clamors to exalt itself, but only when we walk in the Spirit will we not gratify the desires of the flesh. God looks at the heart. The heart in Scripture is a person's inner moral and spiritual life. Proverbs 4.23 explains that everything we do flows from the heart. The heart is the core, the inner essence of who we are. 
And in Luke 6, 45, we read, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks, but the heart is full of. To everyone who saw him, Judas Iscariot looked like a faithful disciple. But his appearance was deceiving. The other disciples had no idea what was going on inside Judas. Jesus was the only one who knew Judas's heart. He said in John 6, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? God's perspective is higher, deeper, and wiser than ours. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says the eyes of God are continually roaming throughout the earth to strengthen people whose hearts are fully committed to him. God can peer into our hearts, examine our motivations, and know everything there is to know about us. God knows if a person will be faithful. God sees what people can't see. King David was far from perfect. He committed adultery and murder, but God saw in David a man of deep, abiding faith who was wholly committed to himself, to, to the Lord. God saw a man who would depend on him for strength and guidance. God saw a man who would recognize his sin and failure and who would repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness. God saw in David a man who loved the Lord, a man who worshiped his Lord with all his being, a man who had experienced God's cleansing and forgiveness and had come to understand the depths of God's love for him. God saw a man with a sincere and personal relationship with him. So when God looked upon the heart of David, he saw a man that knew his own heart. Like Samuel, we can't see what the Lord sees. We must rely on him for wisdom, and we can trust that. When God looks at our hearts, he sees our faithfulness, our character, and our value as individuals. It has been said that the mysterious eternal combustion full of worthy motivation is sustained when you know you're important to a worthy cause. Right now, we have the power to do great good for others in the name of Jesus. So what I ask you today is that you begin to give your life away in ways that matter for the right reason. And that right reason is because you love Jesus Christ. And you continue as you began. And I think you'll find that in the end, you will have far more than you ever had in terms of blessings and you will have done more and been a blessing to others, more so than you ever dreamed. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, we have received, they have received their reward, reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Christians who are motivated by anything but the love that they have for Christ their Savior will end up burnt out, bitter and broken. Motives matter. What motivates the Muslim is fear of punishment for failing to meet the five Muslim tenets. What motivates the Buddhist is the need to create positive karma for the afterlife. What motivates the Hindu is the uh, moksha, or enlightenment, that leads to absorption into the universe. And what motivates the Christian should be the love of Jesus poured out as he died on the cross and rose again for us. 1 Corinthians 11 says, even with regard to coming to the Lord's table, which we're about to do, 
God tests our motives so that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 27, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of Jesus. Assess your motives. Look at your heart. Look at it honestly. God sees why you do what you do. And when you do it out of love for him, he will honor that and bless that. And so as we come to his table today, let's examine our hearts. Let's look at our motives. Let's see what, why we really do what we do in the church and let's make any corrections we need to make. Let's do what we do out of the love for our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come now to your table, Lord, we ask that you would be with us in a very special way, that you would guide us and keep us so that we might come to this table worthy, not because of anything we have done, but because of your blessing, your grace, your forgiveness, and your presence in our lives. May we come knowing that we come to the table of the King, we come to the table of our Savior, and help us to come, Lord, because of the love that we have for you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us turn up in the morning.